Hello there. Welcome to another episode of the Midweek Refill with your host, Bishop A. Reginald Littman. It is such a joy always to share the Word of God with you in these teaching sessions. I'd like to invite you and encourage you to like, share, subscribe, hit the thumbs up button, and make sure when you subscribe, you hit the bell notification. That way you're notified every time new content is loaded or whenever I go live. And so I'm excited to share this teaching with you. For the past probably three months now, we have been engaged in a series of teachings that falls under the general heading of trusting God with your entire life. We've covered a number of topics concerning trusting God with your family, trusting God with your future, trusting God with your finances, trusting God with so many different areas of life. And tonight or this week, I want to share with you about trusting God with your failure. That's right, your failure. Many of us have experienced failure in our life, and some of us admit it, some of us acknowledge it, others don't. But the reality is we've all had moments where we dropped the ball, where we mishandled a situation, or some type of way we've messed up, we've made mistakes. And if you're a person who can say you've never made a mistake, that was your mistake. <laughs> because all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, according to Romans 3 and 23. But here's what I want you to know at the offset of this teaching is that failure is not final and failure is not fatal. Somebody ought to type that in the comments. Failure is not final. And thank God, failure is not fatal. So we're going to learn about trusting God with your failure. Now, friends, failure is a universal experience. And at times, it can be discouraging. It can be extremely disheartening. However, as Christians, we're called to trust God even in the midst of our failures. So in this particular study, we're going to explore the scriptural foundation for trusting God with our failures. And we're also going to learn from the stories of individuals who faced failure and discover how to apply these lessons to our everyday life. So again, make sure you like, share, subscribe. Make sure you leave a comment. I want to know how this teaching is impacting your life and how you're going to use it to change the trajectory of your future by trusting God with your failure. All right, so let's jump into this week's teaching because it is important that we understand at the very foundation one truth. That is this. As believers, we are called to trust God even in the midst of our failures. So even when we drop the ball, even when life happens, even when the worst possible scenario we think occurs in our life, in our journey, we must trust God even in the midst of our failures. So we want to lay some scriptural foundation for trusting God with our failures and learn from the stories of individuals who faced failure and discover how we can apply those lessons to our own individual's lives so that we can trust God with our failures. After all, the Bible is recorded for us to learn even from the experiences of others who have messed up, not just the folks who were uh, successful and on top of the mountain, but even from those who went through valley experiences. And so here's point number one for this week. In order to really trust God with your failures, you must, number one, acknowledge your failures. Type that into the comments right now. Acknowledge your failures. Acknowledge your failures. Now, I want to go to Psalm 51, verse 3 and 4 from the New International Version. And there we find the words that are attributed to, to, to David after he committed adultery with Bathsheba and was confronted by the prophet Nathan. He says this, for I know my transgressions and my sin is always before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. 
So you are right in your verdict and justified when you judge. Now, in Psalm 51, King David, who we know is a man after God's own heart, always in pursuit of God's heart, God's favor, God's pleasure, he faced failure when he committed adultery with Bathsheba and had her husband Uriah killed. But despite his failure, he acknowledged his sins before God. And that's what we have to understand, is that we must acknowledge our failures, acknowledge our sins before God. Don't try to act like it didn't happen, like we're not guilty, like we've not, never made a mistake, like we've never messed up, but acknowledge your failure to God. And that's what we see in David's example to us in Psalm 51. So I want to ask you a question because this is really important that we understand that to keep our relationship with God at an optimal level, we need to be able to be honest and real with God. So here's my question for you. I want you to reflect on your recent failures, recent shortcomings. Are there areas in your life where you need to acknowledge your mistakes before God? Now, before you answer no, we often only limit faults, failures, if you want to call it sin, if you want to call it shortcomings, if you want to call it mistakes, whatever you want to name it, however you want to label it, it's up to you. But we often limit it to three or four things, and that would be sleeping, sipping, and smoking, okay? But there's a whole lot of things that we do that are wrong that can cause us to have some issues in terms of our intimacy with God that we need to acknowledge. For instance, when you tell a white lie, or for that matter, when you color code your lies, that is something that you should acknowledge as something that is a mistake before God. And I know you may say, well, I was trying to help somebody or I was trying to save my own hide or whatever the case may be, but was it right to do it? That's the question. Um, how about gossip? How about uh, talking about people? That's probably something that most folks do from time to time. Even if you're talking about your cousin with your uncle, was it right to do it? Was it something that would be pleasing in the eyesight of God, as far as you know. So this question is much, much bigger than, you know, whether or not you got drunk. That's not even what I'm talking about. I'm talking about, are there areas in your life where you need to acknowledge your mistakes before God? So that's a very probing question, and I want you to really think about it as we move now to our second principle for trusting God with your failures. So here's number two. Number two is seek God's forgiveness. Seek God's forgiveness. So it's one thing to acknowledge our wrong, but it is a totally different issue and animal to actually seek God's forgiveness. Now, I love what the scriptures teach us concerning this particular passage. 1 John 1 and verse number 9 says this, If we confess our sins, he, that is Christ, is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Isn't that powerful? If we're willing to confess it, to confess means to agree with God that I have done wrong. It means to say, God, you are right about me. If you remember the passage from Psalm 51, notice what David says at the end of that fourth verse. So you are right in your verdict. God, you are right and justified when you judge. So that is a confession. I agree with God about my wrong. 
And if we confess our wrong to God, God is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Isn't it interesting that in the popular ministries and prestigious prominent pulpits of America, the one word that seems to have escaped the vernacular of the American Christian preacher, Bible teacher is that word sin. But it's still in the Bible and sin is also still in the church. And sin is also still prevalent in many of our lives. And if we want to have and to maintain an intimate connection with God, we've got to trust God with our failures and we've got to confess to him. Now you may say, why do I need to confess to God my sins? If he's God, he knows it already. He knows what I've done. He knows where I am. And you are 1000% right. He knows exactly where we are. But God wants to do for us as he did for Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. That is, give us a chance to fess up. Give us a chance to show our allegiance, our honesty, our purity of heart, our motive toward him. That's why we are invited, we are encouraged. And notice this, it's, a, it's in the conditional tone, if, meaning it is a choice that you make to do so. So if we confess our sins, it's suggestive. If we have a pure heart, pure motive toward God, God will in turn faithfully and justly forgive us and purify us from all of the unrighteousness. So sin may be defined as unrighteousness because when you come to God with those things that are unpleasant in his sight, he promises to forgive and to purify from what you've brought to him. But watch this. If you never bring it to him, then you never give him the freedom or the right, if you will, to purify you from it. And for a lot of people, ladies and gentlemen, we go around with years of built up, pinned up, emotions of feeling guilt and feeling so many different things, low self-worth, simply because we're carrying things we were never made to carry, never meant to carry. I'm reminded of that line from that great hymn of the church, oh, what needless pain we bear, all because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. So 1 John 1 and 9 is so powerful because it tells us what to do with our failures. It also lets us know that we don't have to be burdened and we don't have to be encumbered with failure, with sin, with those things that uh, we do, that we have failed to do, those things that we know are not for us to do. Someone has said that sin is missing the mark, that God has set a standard, a target for our lives. And when we sin, it literally means that we miss the mark with the arrow that God places into our hands. So don't be a person who consistently misses the mark, but instead be connected and reunited with your heavenly father so that he can cleanse you and purify you of anything that is not right. Is that powerful or what? So if you haven't sought God's forgiveness for your failures, here's a great truth I want you to hold on to. Know the forgiveness of the Lord is available to you. And here's what I love about God. And I tell people this all the time. A lot of folks don't believe this, but it doesn't matter what you've done. Forgiveness is available to you. And that's so refreshing to me because it means that you don't have to walk around carrying weight, depression, carrying the burden of unfulfilled living simply because you have not 
access the forgiveness that is available to you. And that's what God wants to give you is a total new life of peace, joy, righteousness, and oneness with him because he lives on the inside of you. But we have to make the inside comfortable for the Holy Spirit to dwell. All right. (laughs) So let's go now to an example of what I'm talking about. You know, Peter, one of Jesus' closest disciples, denied knowing Jesus three times during the crucifixion. After his failure, though, one of the most powerful things is that after Peter's failure, Christ did not fail to remember him. Because in the scriptures, we learn that when Jesus rose from the grave, the angel had a message, not only for the disciples, but also for Peter. That Jesus said, go tell my disciples and Peter to meet me in Galilee. Which means forgiveness is available for you. By the way, Don't forget to check the description box below to access the free PDF handout that goes along with this teaching. Every, all of the good nuggets that I'm saying right now, you can have it in your hand. You can print it out. You can email it to your neighbors, to your friends, to your family, have your own little Bible discussion and talk deeper through the personal discovery questions that I include with every lesson. So don't forget to check that out at the end of uh, this Bible study. All right, let's go to number three. So number three, we must learn from our failures, learn from our failures. Now, I want to tell you something. Failure is not meant to be lived in, but learned from. Let me say that again. Failure is not meant to be lived in, but learned from. All right. So learn from your failures. Don't live in your failures failures. Let's look at the word of God here, Proverbs chapter 24 and verse number 16. It says this, for though the righteous fall seven times, they arise again, but the wicked stumble when calamity strikes. And here's what this passage is telling us is that we don't have to fall and stay down because Because God lives in us, because we have covenant with God, because we can go to God, because we have a heart for God, and we want God to feel comfortable within us, we can be considered the righteous who do fall, but get back up again. And that's the power of confession and repentance and prayer, is that we don't deny the fact that we're going to make some mistakes that we're going to miss the mark. But we do accept the fact that we have a relationship and connection with God that we don't have to stay down when we do fall. So the righteous fall seven times. They rise again. But the wicked stumble when calamity strikes. So when calamity happens and things happen again, uh, the righteous may fall, but those who don't have connection with God will stumble and stay down and succumb to calamity in their lives, right? So I want you to think about that and how that the forgiveness forgiveness of God is available to you. You know, Thomas, who was one of the other of the 12, also had issues with Jesus. He doubted Jesus' resurrection until he saw the scars in Jesus's hands and Jesus's feet. And yet his doubt would then turn into an unwavering faith because God has a way of taking our faults, our falls, our frailty, and our failures and turning them into something that is fashioned for our future. Thomas, after doubting Christ and going through all of that, could now minister to folks on a level that the others could not because he had seen it for himself. So the question I want to ask you is, I want you to, again, consider your failures and consider the doubts that you faced, maybe about what God has said to you 
what maybe about what God could do in your life personally. Maybe you've doubted that God could bless you in a certain way. How can you learn from these experiences to grow stronger in your faith and in your relationship with God? I want you to think about that this week, and you'll find this question on the handout. There it is linked right there in the description below. All right, so let's go a little further now. And here's number four. So principle number four this week is trust God's plan. I cannot talk about trusting God's plan enough. Remember, the title of this series is Trusting God in Every Area of Your Life. Trust God's plan, not your own. I love Jeremiah 29 and 11. It tells us these are God's words attributed to God himself. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans for welfare, not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. How many times have you and I failed at something and we felt like because we failed at it, there was no coming back from it? But guess what? God knows how to use the ups and the downs in your story to give you an ultimate blessing at the end, to give you a future and a hope. You know, as I think about that, I'm reminded of Joseph's trials. In Genesis chapter 37 through chapter 50, we find the amazing winding story of Joseph. Joseph endured betrayal by his brothers false accusations, imprisonment, and yet he ultimately trusted God's plan and became second in command as a powerful leader in a foreign country. You see, when you stop trusting your own thoughts and your own plans and your own stinking thinking and trust God's plan, that's when you will discover that you can trust God with your failures. So the question I want to ask you to think about is how can you lean on his promises even when circumstances seem bleak? God wants you to understand that in times of failure, you have to trust his plan and lean not to your own understanding, but lean toward God's plan for your life, knowing he never makes mistakes. And that's for somebody that's listening to me right now. God is not making mistakes in your life. Even when things are not adding up, lean on his plan, not your own. And here's number five. So principle number five for this week is share your story. So trusting God with your failures involves sharing your story. Listen to Paul's words here in 2 Corinthians chapter 1. Verse 3 and 4 says, praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our troubles, so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves receive from God. What an amazing passage of scripture that is. Here Paul is saying, I give God all praise and glory. I praise God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, He is the father of compassion. He is the God who comforts and the God who comforts us in our trouble. And here's why he does it. So that we can comfort others in their trouble with the comfort we ourselves have received from God. That's a testimony. And when you trust God with your failures, one of the ways that is evidence of that is that you share your story, is that you don't try to hide all of your failures. I know you can't tell everybody everything. That's not safe in this day and time, especially in this time of social media. But somebody needs to hear your testimony. Somebody needs to know what God has done in your life. And as I think about sharing stories and talking about the goodness of God, I think about Paul's own perseverance. You know, the apostle Paul faced numerous hardships and failures, but he used every one of them to minister to others and to share the Gospels. Most of his New Testament letters were prison letters. He was pen pals with the church members. And so he was addressing storms in the church and situations that they were experiencing. Yet, that book of Philippians is all about the joy of Jesus 
even when he didn't know what would be the outcome of his case or if he would walk out or be carried out of that Philippian prison. So when you trust God with your failures, it means that you're willing to share the stories with others of how you have actually overcome. What we need to do is to use our experiences of failure to encourage and to comfort other people. Amen. So I want to take you back so you will kind of recall everything that we've talked about. I want you to think about how you can use your experiences of failure to encourage and to comfort other people. Are there individuals in your life who could benefit from hearing your story of trusting God in times of failure? Who are those people that need to hear your story, need to hear your voice? so that they can learn how to trust God with their failures. Wow. So let's go back and review. Number one, trusting God with your failures means acknowledge your failures. Don't try to hide it. Talk to God about it. Number two, it means seeking God's forgiveness. So it means asking him to cleanse you, purify you of all those mistakes that you've made today, every day and he will be faithful and just to do just that. Number three, trusting God with your failures means learning from your failures. Remember, we don't live in our failures, we learn from our failures. And then number four, trusting God with your failures means trusting God's plan. Not leaning to our own understanding as Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 teaches, but only relying on God, leaning on God's plan for our life trusting that he has one. Jeremiah 29, 11, he says, I know and only I know is the the inference there, the plans I have for your life. Number five, share your story. Share your story. So I want you to find someone that needs encouragement this week and share your story of how you've overcome failure in your life this week. That's your assignment for the week. Also, I do want to remind you again that there is a handout with personal discovery questions that will help you take a deeper dive into the passages and the teaching for this week. And you can find that in the description. See, right there, right there, right there in the description box below. As always, thank you so much for watching and being with us this week. Please, please, please don't forget to like, share, share and subscribe, hit the bell notification. We want to reach 1,000 subscriptions to our YouTube channel. So help us do that by subscribing to the channel. Hey, as always, this is Bishop Littman. I love you. Don't forget to like, share, subscribe, and hit that bell notification. And until next time, you go with God.